Tonight I want to talk about a special painting that hangs on the wall on the fourth floor of the Salt Lake Temple. Here it is where the First Presidency and the Council of the Twelve meet weekly to discuss church affairs as they pertain to worldwide structuring and management. Incidentally, on this fourth floor, the beautiful First Presidency and Council of the Twelve room where few, if any, people see this room because it's not available in the Salt Lake Temple to patrons, but set apart for the holding of meetings of the First Presidency and the Twelve. It's a beautiful room, about 30 feet wide and 50 feet long, and has ceiling height of about 12 feet. It is decorated in soft pastel colors with fixtures and furnishings that are in good taste and practical. In the front of this room and in the center are three chairs for the First Presidency to occupy. In a semicircle across the room from them are 12 seats where the members of the 12 sit. In this setting of privacy and temple warmth, the various divisions, departments, councils, programs, and other needs of the church are studied, reviewed, and decisions are made. Worldwide areas and growth challenges are examined and supervised. Personnel needs are discussed, prayed over, and service calls determined. On the front of the wall in this fourth floor temple room are three original Harry Anderson paintings, each one approximately 40 by 34 inches. One painting titled Christ Calling Peter and Andrew is of the Savior in white robes walking along a seashore. He is beckoning to Peter and Andrew who are on a fishing boat with other fishermen to follow him and be fishers of men. The painting depicts Christ calling of Peter and Andrew to follow him as they would later be ordained as his apostles. Another painting titled The Crucifixion is a rendering of the Savior hanging on a cross at Calvary. Two thieves also hanging on crosses are at the right and left of Christ. Numerous observers, including Mary, the mother of Christ, Mary Magdalene, other mourners, and Roman soldiers are gathered around the crosses. Thunderclouds are gathered in the sky. The third painting is titled The Resurrection. Mary is in the garden by the open tomb looking up at the resurrected Christ before his ascension. Around the other walls and parts of the room are pictures beginning with Joseph Smith, and include the other 12 presidents of the church, namely Brigham Young, John Taylor, Wilford Woodruff, Lorenzo Snow, Joseph F. Smith, Heber J. Grant, George Albert Smith, David O. McKay, Joseph Fielding Smith, Harold B. Lee, Spencer W. Kendall, Kimball, and Ezra Taft Benson. In this setting, there is only one other picture in the entire room, and that is of Joseph Smith's brother, Hiram. It is not only appropriate, but a genuine tribute, proper and merciful, that the portrait of this great man is on display with the Savior and the prophets of this dispensation. Not only a faithful brother and advocate of Joseph, and I thought of that as we sang praise to the man tonight. We could say, in keeping with what I'm saying, praise to the man and include Hiram. He was not only a constant advocate of Joseph, but all who met him regarded him as a personification, the personification of integrity. And again, verily I say unto you, blessed is my servant Hiram Smith, for I, the Lord, love him because of the integrity of his heart and because he loveth that which is right before me, saith the Lord. John Taylor said of Hiram, If ever there was an exemplary, honest, and virtuous man, 
and embodiment of all that is noble in human form, Hiram Smith was its representative. John Taylor also said of Joseph and Hiram Smith, they are two of the best of Adam's race. Hiram was an older brother, six years senior to Joseph, and stood by his side in life and death. The age differential never seemed to make a difference in Hiram's attitude toward his younger brother. He was his friend, his advocate, and strength. Joseph maintained an especially close tie to his brother Hiram all of his life. Joseph said, never in all my life have I and others seen anything more beautiful than the striking brotherly love and devotion that Hiram felt for me. William Tater made that comment after seeing them together many, many times. I witnessed this many, many times, said Brother Taylor, no matter how often or when or where they met, it was always with the same expression of supreme joy. It could not have been otherwise when both were filled to overflowing with the gift and power of the Holy Ghost. It was kindred spirits meeting. In section two of the Doctrine and Covenants, verses six through 10, cover some direct revelation instructions and guidelines and promises for Hiram Smith only. Now, as you have asked, behold, I am say unto you, Hiram, keep my commandments and seek to bring forth and establish the cause of Zion. And this scripture that you know so well and hear so frequently was directed originally toward Hiram. Seek not for riches, but for wisdom. And behold, the mysteries of God shall be unfolded unto you, and then shall you be made rich. Behold, he that hath eternal life is rich. Verily, verily, I say unto you, even as you desire of me, so it shall be done unto you. And if you desire, you shall be the means of doing much good in this generation. Say nothing but repentance unto this generation. Keep my commandments, Hiram, and assist to bring forth my work according to my commandments, and you shall be blessed. Behold, thou hast a gift, or thou shalt have a gift if thou wilt desire of me in faith with an honest heart, believing in the power of Jesus Christ, or in my power which speaketh through thee. Also in section 138, verse 33, it is pointed that Hiram was one of the mighty ones in the spiritual world. These mighty ones were taught faith in God, repentance from sin, vicarious baptism for the remission of sins, the gift of the Holy Ghost by the laying on of hands. Verse 55 reveals that Hiram was among the noble and great ones who were chosen in the beginning to be rulers in the church's God. It has been rightly said that the role of Hiram in the restoration of the gospel subsequent to the organization of the church was second only to that of his brother Joseph. History points out to us that the prophet Joseph Smith did nothing of importance without first counseling with his brother Hiram. Always it seemed that when Joseph was in trouble or in deep danger or heavy in burdens, he was to seek out his older brother for help and advice. Hiram was always wise and consistent. Joseph's faith and trust in his remarkable brother Hiram is displayed in the beginning of the Nauvoo period. Hiram acted as president of the church while Joseph went to Washington, D.C. to obtain redress for losses in Missouri. Hiram was a peacemaker, a man of integrity, an honest individual. It was said of Hiram he would never knowingly offend any man. Nevertheless, 
He was relentless in hating wrong. On one occasion, Joseph said that if Hiram, my brother, cannot make peace between two who are in disagreement, the angels themselves not, might not hope to accomplish the task. About the 20th of June, 1844, only seven days before the martyrdom, Joseph urged Hiram to take his family to Cincinnati for safety. Hiram answered simply, pardon my emotion, Hiram answered simply, Joseph, I cannot leave you. It is not uncommon when a younger brother is highly honored, the elder brother in the family manifests a spirit of jealousy, envy, and resentment, resulting sometimes in discontent and open opposition, but never with Hiram. He accepted the great vision and the mission of his brother Joseph in the most sacred and loyal spirit of humility. On one occasion when William Smith, the prophet's younger brother, took occasion to abuse Joseph with words of violence, Hiram came to his defense of the prophet in a powerful, mighty way. This loyalty in action elicited the following expression of appreciation from Joseph. I could pray in my heart that all my brethren were like unto my beloved brother Hiram, who possessed the meekness and humility of Christ, and I love him with that love that is stronger than death, for I never had occasion to rebuke him, nor he me, which he declared when he left me today. Hiram was honest in his dealings with all of his fellow men. He was versatile and could apply himself in all situations. It is reported he could shoe an ox, plow, sell books, trade potatoes, preach a funeral sermon, try a case, administer the sick, ordain, rebuke the wicked, give counsel, aid the poor, perform ordinances, and preach the gospel with equal effectiveness. He was trusted. He was believed. He was a man of integrity. It is reported by one of the biographers, quote, when Lydia went to his home, he, Hiram, was about 35 or 40 years of age, tall, well-framed with a fine, handsome countenance, with blue eyes, and his face was full of intelligence and spirit. His manner was dignified. He was amiable and vivacious, with all exceedingly courteous and fascinating to all with whom he ever had a relationship. He was really a worthy brother of a prophet, and together they were a worthy pair in the sight of the Lord. The pride of Joseph Smith Sr., of his two sons, Joseph and Hiram, was a delight to behold. On one occasion, the father laid his hands upon Hiram's head and said, My son Hiram, I seal upon your head your patriarchal blessing, which I placed upon your head before, for that blessing shall be verified. In addition to this, I now give you my dying blessing. You shall have a season of peace, so that you shall have sufficient rest to accomplish the work which God has given you to do. This wonderful tribute you shall be as firm as the pillars of heaven unto the end of your days. I now seal upon your head the patriarchal power, and you shall bless this people. This is my dying blessing upon your head, my son Hiram, in the name of Jesus. When Oliver Cowdley lost his standing, the Lord transferred to Hiram Smith all the power and authority which had been given to Oliver Cowdery, and Hiram Smith became the associate president of the church. Holding these keys jointly with his brother Joseph and standing with him at the head of the great and last dispensation, it was because of this great honor 
that it was bestowed upon Hiram Smith that he was called to be the companion of the prophet Joseph in martyrdom. After sharing many persecutions and life-threatening experiences together, the prophet wrote, There was my brother Hiram, who took me by a hand, a natural brother. Thought I to myself, Brother Hiram, what a faithful heart you have got. Oh, may the eternal Jehovah crown eternal blessings upon your head and reward you for the care you have had for my soul. Oh, how many are the sorrows we've shared together. And again, we find ourselves shackled with the unrelenting hand of oppression. Hiram, thy name shall be written in the book of the law of the Lord for those who come after thee to look upon that they may pattern after thy works. Hiram, during his whole life, walked uprightly before the Lord, which, brothers and sisters, means correctly, honestly, justly, and honorably. Hiram Smith, I think of every time I read the 13th article of faith. He seems to be the embodiment of that priceless statement that all of us should keep before us constantly. We believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, in doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things, we hope all things. We have endured many things and hope to be able to endure all things. If there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. President David O. McKay frequently said, and I would have you who are courting to take special note, it is better to be trusted than to be loved. I hope the element of trust will be prayed for as we contemplate important decisions in our lives, even marriage. Can he be trusted? Can she be trusted? Does he know what trust is all about? It is difficult, if not impossible, to lump someone you do not trust. A good friend of mine learned the importance of this and the significance of being a person of integrity at a relatively young age in life. In one of her high school classes, there was a requirement to attend the lab period before school officially began. It was early in the morning, and in order to get credit for the lab, the students would sign their name in a roll book at the beginning of the class period. The roll book was located on the teacher's desk at the front of the room. One morning, while standing in line waiting to sign the book, Roxanne, a very popular girl in school, was standing in the doorway. She motioned my friend to come and talk to her. She did, and Roxanne asked her if she would sign her name for her so she could get credit for attending the class, even though she wouldn't actually be there. Roxanne was a student body officer and had to attend a special meeting for the student body officers. Without hesitating at all, my friend said to her, sure, I'll do that for you. She really didn't know this girl very well. She was someone who everyone liked and was very popular in school, but she was only an acquaintance of my friend. Meanwhile, she went back to the desk and signed her name, and then signed Roxanne's name in her handwriting below her signature. The teacher was obviously smarter than my friend realized, that there were 20 students attending class and 21 who had signed the role. Because the handwriting was the same, the teacher knew that my friend had signed Roxanne's name for her. The teacher in the middle of the lab session announced that there was a discrepancy in the number of students who had signed the role and the number who were actually there in the class. 
Then she called out her name and asked if she would go to the back of the room while the rest of them continued on with their assignments in the class. The teacher then proceeded to impress upon her a most important lesson, one she told me she had ne would never forget. She can't remember most of what the teacher said to her, except that she was very embarrassed and ashamed. Incidentally, this friend of mine was a top scholar, a wonderful personality. But the one thing she said she does remember was this question, which the teacher asked. Why were you willing to sacrifice your integrity for the sake of that girl? You see, she was a very good student, a student who was trusted and respected in that high school. She had let her teachers down. She was willing to sacrifice something which was more precious to her because of peer pressure or wanting to be liked, because of a fear that someone wouldn't like her if she didn't do her a favor. My friend learned in a very significant way that it is more important to be trusted than to be loved, that a person's integrity is of supreme importance. Never in the history of mankind or the church or Brigham Young University or the Utah Community College has there been a greater need for honesty in personal lives. Honesty with neighbors, integrity in discussions and total commitment on the basis of full trust and respect for those who are about us. Certainly we have reason to be disappointed and concerned when we see too many businesses and professional associates adopting as the best policy, not honesty, but what can I get away without being caught? Or what is expedient? What will bring the most profit? What will be the most rewarding for me without regard to performance or other people? Integrity must be the foundation of moral life. In school and in daily associations, we must teach students and children, as well as adults, that honesty must be 100% and not treated as a convenience or escape in some situations. We must fight corruption and graft and return people to the basics of integrity, honesty, and fair play. Achievement and talent without character are hollow. Dr. David Serrett, who taught mathematics at Vanderbilt University for many years, before giving a test would admonish his class something like this, quote, Today I'm giving two examinations, one in trigonometry and the other in honest, the other in honesty. I hope you'll pass them both, but if you must fail, fail in trigonometry. There are many people in the world who can't pass trig, but there is no one who can't pass the examination of honesty." Close quote. The Lord said to Hiram on that important occasion, Behold, I speak unto you, Hiram, a few words, for thou also art under no condemnation, and thy heart is open, and thy tongue loosened, and thy calling is to exhort and to strengthen the church continually. And this great charge to our wonderful friend Hiram Smith, Wherefore thy duty is unto the church forever, and this because of thy family. Very often when we think about honesty and integrity, it is well for us to ask ourselves the question, how will I feel about my conduct today, tomorrow? Will character and integrity be the foundation of all my performances? Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door, I am the good shepherd, I am the way and the truth and the life. Hiram Smith made these goals and characteristics part of his life on a continuing, steady basis. As I look at that picture of the oil painting of Hiram Smith, as it hangs prominently in the Salt Lake Temple on the fourth floor, among the other great leaders of the church, 
Incidentally, I find Hiram Smith just over my left shoulder as I look around the room. A church and other renditions showing events worthy remembrance in the life of our Savior Jesus Christ. I am impressed with Hiram Smith's life, his attitude, and the love that the Lord had for him. Fellow students, the Lord will always have a special love for those who embrace the right. May God help us to realize that in Hiram Smith, we have a man who is worthy of example, as he was in the early history of the Church. Firm, steadfast, and true, not only to his prophet, to his father, but to the Savior Jesus Christ and his eternal Father. When we hear of him or see his picture or think of the prophet, let us recommit ourselves to the principles that he lived for and died for. May our chosen paths lead us to do what is right and let the consequences follow. The consequences of doing what is right, as with Hiram, will bring personal victory and the love and continuing trust of the Lord. I leave you my special witness that one of the great strengths and powers, sometimes hidden and not known in the life of the prophet Joseph Smith, was his brother Hiram, a man of great integrity, a man who loved the right. And I leave you these thoughts and my blessings in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.